I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about voodoo, responsive tables, JavaScript graphs, and more. Let's check it out. First up is Voodoo.js. Now, this is a JavaScript library that allows you to mix 3D and 2D elements on a single web page. It's pretty impressive. So let's take a look. So it says Voodoo is a new JavaScript framework that lets you easily mix 2D and 3D content together on the same page. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's scroll down the page and look at this graph over here. Whoa, that's pretty cool. And as I scroll, you can see that it actually parallaxes in 3D. There's more pronounced examples here, like this palm tree. What? So as I scroll up and down, you can see it's actually in 3D and it's mixing with this text here that's just a normal HTML paragraph. So that's pretty impressive. Now, even more impressive is this ring down here at the bottom. You'll see that it's actually in front of the text, but it's also simultaneously behind the text. And actually, I can highlight this you can see that it is real text on the page. In fact, I can even bring up the Chrome developer tools here and highlight this little bit here. And you can see it's just a normal EM element what? there. So it is actually there on the page. It's not like rendering this text magically or something. Uh, so how is this happening? Well, it's using WebGL to do its 3D rendering, which is currently supported in Chrome and Firefox. And if you enable it in Safari, it's supported there. And I believe it's supported in Internet Explorer 11. So support is definitely on the rise. And the way that they're doing this is by rendering two different WebGL canvases. There is one that is above and one that is below and then they're fusing them together with a seam here. And with a little bit of anti-aliasing, it basically, basically removes all of the uh, jagged pixels there and kind of fuses it together. So it's pretty smart. Now, how does this work? Well, if we go over to the documentation, the two really big important things here are the model and the view. Now, the model is a base class that you can extend and it contains objects managed by the Voodoo rendering engine. So it's a, a model is a single 3D object. Now, if we click on view, you'll see that the view is also uh, extendable and every model should have a view. And a model uh, basically contains uh, information about uh, the state of an object. So if we switch over to my text editor here, I actually want you to see what this code looks like in action. This is a sample that you can download with Voodoo. So there's a view here, and we're extending it. And one thing I forgot to mention is that Voodoo does rely on 3.js, which is another WebGL library. So basically, we can create a torus here, which is basically a donut shape. We can apply a material or a texture uh, to describe what the surface of that looks like. And then we can actually add that to the scene. There we go. And we can position it and all that good stuff. Then we also have a function here to move the torus in 3D space. And down here in the model, which is used to, again, describe the state of 3D objects, we have an update function right here. Now, if you're familiar with game engines or if you're familiar with uh, 3D graphics, your update function basically runs every frame. And by passing in delta time here, you can tell it uh, how long it's been since the last frame. So it will know how far to move that donut back and forth. And if we go down here, uh, the last thing we do after declaring, or excuse me, extending the uh, view and model, we just call the sample model. And in the browser, you'll get something that looks like this. So there is that 
torus. It has a red color and we've positioned it so that it's around some text here. Anyway, uh, Voodoo is pretty amazing. I, I think this is a really, really cool project and you should definitely check this out. Uh, WebGL is being supported in more and more browsers than ever and uh, it's definitely time to start uh, using it in websites. Yeah, super, super impressive demos. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, we have a project called Responsive Tables. This is a very, very descriptive name for what it is, which as you might guess is responsive tables for your web page. Let's go ahead and check it out. So you can see down here, um, so whatever you just install it, add the CSS and the JavaScript, put in a couple classes and your markup, just add class is table responsive and you are good to go. Now here is a demo. Look at, look at all this information inside of the table. Now, if we go ahead and resize the browser to make it responsive, wow, look at that. All of our stuff is gone. We only have a couple different columns. Well, what if we wanted more columns? Well, just click that display button and the different columns collapse, but you can add them back in automatically and then go ahead and scroll up and down the table. Also supports this little focus button right here. So if you wanna click on a row, you get just that information. Now, this is super simple to use. The way that you set up your table is you give each of your table heading elements a priority. Now, the priorities correspond to different breakpoints. So, priority of one is going to be always visible, but you can hide it inside of that dropdown, and so on and so forth for all of the different priorities. This is a super simple plugin to use. We'll have a link to that in the show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash go treehouse or search for us on iTunes. We are the Treehouse Show. Very cool stuff. Well, next up is Isomer, which is an isometric graphics library for HTML5 Canvas. Now, if you play a lot of video games, you might be familiar with isometric graphics. It's basically a view that renders without any kind of perspective. So it's rendering this at a three quarters view or uh, a side view here basically. And you can see both sides of 3D object and it doesn't have any kind of perspective. Now, uh, how is it rendering this? Because this isn't just a, a picture, it's actually rendering this onto a canvas. Well, with Isomer, you can create a shape and a point and then you add it to the scene or the drawing. So in this case the shape is a prism and it's using the point to position it in 3D space. Now if we scroll down here we can see a slightly more uh, robust example. In this case we are using the point dot origin which uh, should default to just the, the origin of the 3D grid, which you can see here. And then with these three values here, we are defining the width, length, and height of this 3D object. Now, you can obviously use this to build out much more complex examples. So if we click on the playground here, it will take us over to CodePen, and you can see exactly how that example up in the header was built. We are adding a bunch of different isomer objects to our canvas here. And if I change these, so for example, let's just comment one of these out. You can see that the view will update here and it will actually remove that box that's right here. So you can get an idea of how this scene is being built. And I could adjust the width, length, and height here and that should probably make it look a little bit strange because it is being rendered isometrically, but you get the idea. You can very quickly adjust the size or position of these objects and create these nifty little graphics. So very cool stuff. It is a, uh, a paid product. Actually, let me go back here. There we go. Uh, but it's very inexpensive, just $10, uh, and you get uh, two files, which allow you to build the, these pretty amazing uh, 3D graphics. So very cool stuff. However, it is also available for free under the MIT license. I should mention that. So it is actually free, but you can pay for it if 
you like it a lot. Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a project called Digraphs. Um, this is a JavaScript charting and diagramming library. Let's go ahead and check it out right here. Uh, it's super simple to use. You can see this, uh, this chart on the right is generated just from this little snippet of JavaScript right here. It's given a target, which is a div, uh, a data source, which is a text file located on the server, and then just some different options. Do you want a legend, title, and um, labels, and all that good stuff. So if we look on the right right here, as I am moving my mouse across the chart, the different data points are moving, and then it is updating on the top right with the corresponding values. Now you can actually click and drag this graph to zoom in. Double clicking will zoom out. Uh, shift and dragging will pan the charts. And you can even adjust the averaging period. Now there are a bunch of options, as you can see as we go through, just tons of different things that you can do with these graphs. Um, there is a lot of demos right here as well of just generating all of these different graphs. Anyway, this is a completely free project. Go ahead and download it if you need charting or graphing on your site. Very, very great, great project. Next up is a blog post from Brad Frost uh, called Label Mask. And Label Masks, you can see demonstrated right here, basically allow the user to type in some input into a form and then get a preview of how that data is going to be interpreted. Now, if we scroll down here, you can see that Brad was basically inspired by this release from the filament group called Polite Space, but he thought that it had a couple of issues. It's, it's pretty amazing on its own, but he decided to enhance it and scroll down to the demo here. You can see what his result looks like. Now, if I just type in a bunch of garbage here, it will basically show me, well, that's what you know my credit card information is going to look like. Obviously, we don't want something like that. So that way I can type in a number here instead. That is my real credit card number. Please feel free to use it. Uh, basically, this is nice if you've ever typed in a credit card number. You, you know it's difficult to kind of make sure you're typing in the four uh, digit groups just right. But this way, with the label mask, you can look up here and say, okay, this is what it actually looks like on my credit card. And that makes it a lot easier to make sure you're typing in the correct number rather than just looking at the input box, which can be kind of difficult to find those stops for each uh, four digits. Same thing with phone numbers. If you're typing in a phone number and there's no spacing between it when you're actually typing it in, it can be a little bit tough to figure out if you're typing in the correct number, but uh, same deal there. Anyway, uh, you can check out the project on GitHub and use it on your sites. Very cool stuff. Yeah, very nice. I really like that pattern. Really, really good UI. Mm -hmm. Next up over on the Telerik Developer Network, we have a blog post on seven quirks I wish I knew about JavaScript. Now, this is some common quirks when you actually start working with the language that you learn very quickly or slowly, depending on how long it takes you to debug what is wrong. So uh, the first thing they go into is equality. The JavaScript language has uh, the double equals comparison operator, but you're actually most of the time looking to use the triple equals equality operator because they do different things. Also known as the three equals. Three equals, never, never heard that. That's very clever. Mm -hmm. um, the double equals, uh, the example that they give here is a in, an integer of the number one is going to be equal to the string one. So there are two equalities. There is equality and strict equality, which also checks the type. Uh, they go into different things, dot, no dot notation versus bracket notation, context of different functions. We don't have time to go into the entire blog post here, but I do recommend you check it out. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. Very nice stuff. Well, next up is Flex Explorer. 
Now, if you've been watching the development of Flexbox, you might know that Flexbox is pretty close to prime time. I am on the caniuse.com website, which charts the uh, compatibility of various pieces of browser technology. And this is the page for the flexible box layout module from the W3C. And it is now a candidate recommendation. And if you look at the current browsers, Internet Explorer 11, Firefox 28, Chrome 34, and Firefox or Safari 7 now all support it. Uh, with Safari 7, you do need to still use the WebKit prefix. Same with iOS 7, but that's okay. It's also supported on Opera and the latest version of the Android and BlackBerry browsers. That's really good because Flexbox is a new way to lay out web pages without using floats or position or any kind of the traditional elements that you would expect when laying out a web page using multi columns or rows and so on. And it's really great that mobile browsers support it now as well because it's wonderful for responsive web design. Now let's go back to Flex Explorer here and take a look at how this works. Flexbox is a little bit complicated to understand at first, but once you do wrap your head around it, you'll start to understand that it's incredibly intelligent and a very elegant solution to this complex problem of laying out web pages, especially in a responsive context. Um, and in fact, I think this is how web pages will be built in the future, almost definitely. Uh, Flex Explorer allows you to kind of explore how different Flexbox properties work and interact uh, with different elements. So if I resize the browser here, you can see that this page is indeed responsive and all of these different elements kind of flow very nicely. And if I adjust some of these properties here, I can change the number of items, for example. Uh, that's not terribly interesting, but I could change the direction of these different elements. So I could go from row, which is laying out all these uh, elements or flex items in order here, and it will change what's called the flex container and I can change that to column. So now all of these elements are laid out in a column, and that's all done by changing a single CSS value on the flex direction property. Now, if you've ever laid out a multi-column layout, even using a CSS framework, you know that this can actually be a pretty complicated thing to do. There's a lot that has to happen to go from rows to columns. So it's amazing you can do that with just one CSS value, actually, I should have resized the browser there. There's so that's that's what that actually looks like. And when I uh, go down, you can see it is flexible like you would expect. You can also adjust uh, other uh, other properties here, like the justify content um, or the flex wrap, uh, which are a couple different properties that we don't really have time to go in, into here on the show. But anyway, after you learn a little bit about Flexbox, you should definitely check out Flexplore to get a better understanding of what each of those properties and values are going to do. Because Flexbox, while it is very robust and powerful, can be a little bit complicated to understand when you're first learning it. But definitely worth learning because it is almost time to start using that on production-ready sites. The future is now. It is. Tomorrow is today. But that is all we have time for today. Nick, who are you on Twitter? I am at Nick RP. And I am at Jay Cipher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out the show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse or search for us on iTunes. We are the Treehouse Show. And for a 30-day free trial of Treehouse, click the link in the show notes here on YouTube. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com and use that link to get a free month. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week.